We would like to welcome back to the Scott Adams Show, Andy Oak, author of the book, Unusual for Their Time, On the Road with America's First Ladies. For more information about Andy Oak, please visit firstladiesman.com. Welcome back to the Scott Adams Show, Andy. Hey, good to be here. Good to be here with you guys again. Well, we uh, had you on our show, I guess, a little over a month ago, maybe two months ago, and uh, you were nice enough to hand us your book, and my co-host, Leonor Cravota, has been diligently reading your book, and you just finished the book, right? <laughs> I did indeed, and you know what? I got to say, it's such an interesting book because it provides insights about first ladies that are not commonly told, and again, we all hear about certain ones all the time, like Jackie Kennedy or Martha Washington, but you, in your book, you tell stories about first ladies uh, such as um, Julia Grant and some of the other uh, first ladies that we don't hear their stories. We hear the happy, you, you tell some happy stories, and you tell some very, very very sad stories, you know, and well, I, th- you, you just read the book. So uh, why don't, why don't, Leonora, why don't you tell us something that really resonated with okay, you? Okay. Well, one story that really resonated with me was the, the Pierce story. The And I don't want to get too graphic, but the woman whose uh, child was killed on a train when she was on the way to her husband becoming president. And this was the third child that she lost. And the child was lost, it was, it was killed in a train accident in a very graphic way. And she had to go on and become the first lady. And I'm sure yeah. I'm not the first person who's mentioned this to you. No, it, it is. As a matter of fact, my, my copy editor, it, it, it is, it's just a tragic story, but, but my copy editor said that she had to read that chapter three or four times because she couldn't get through it without crying. And I got to tell you, I, 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 in the first round of speeches that I did um, before the book came out, um, I was speaking at the Eisenhower Museum in, um, in Kansas, in Abilene, Kansas, on Mother's Day, and I had to drop it from the speech because I just... I knew that I wasn't going to be able to get through it without kind of choking yeah. up because as you see and learn in the book, it's not a research book such like sitting in a library and reading over things, although I did do plenty of that. This is the this is the journey. This is what I did. This is walking tens of thousands of miles in the footsteps, literally, of these women. And I walked the train tracks in Andover, Massachusetts, where that train went off the rails and resulted in the death of, as you mentioned, the, the, the last of three children that the Pierce's had. And, you know, I think that for the most part, the women that we do know about, as far as first ladies and the ones that we can name, like you mentioned, the Jacqueline Kennedy, and, you know, Martha Washington and, and uh, Nancy Reagan, you know, on and on and on, the ones that we can name. But the ones that we can't name, I think, need to be highlighted because they were severely, uh, uh, they, they, their impact on the country was, was felt, and, and they were in the White House. But, but what we know about these women is their time in the White House. So I wanted to get out and explore and find out more about these women before and after they were in the White House, when they were young women, young brides, you know, mothers, daughters, nieces, you know, who were these women? And they all, they are real people, you know, they, we, we put them on this pedestal, we get them, we elect them into this White House, and sure, we're supposed to be their bosses, they work for us, but they are celebrities, and, and they are, for their time in there, the most well-known people, couple, potentially, in, in the entire world, most recognizable. Um, and so to get in and find out these stories, and they're not always pleasant. They are real people. They live, they love, they die, they lose, they win. I mean, there's ups and downs, and, and those, as you mentioned, are, are told in the book. And it was just an amazing journey. And, and Jane Pierce is, sticks out as, as one of my, I hesitate to say favorites, because she was such a tragic first lady. I, I, don't, I don't, you know... She, she was just one of the most interesting, for sure. And by contrast, you have Julia Grant, who absolutely loved being First Lady. So you have these stories of people that were like, they loved the, they loved the role, and then you have these women that created libraries, that created uh, other arts v- vehicles, that made tremendous contributions that we don't hear all of these stories. So, you know, your journey, your physical journey to record and document all of this has created a great legacy with this book. And, um, and again, I can't not recommend, recommend it any more highly than I do. Well, I greatly appreciate it. And you're right, Abigail Fillmore, she's the first first lady to bring a library into the White House because she was a librarian. That's how she and Millard Fillmore went. He was getting better educated and uh, frequented the library that she worked at in, in East Aurora, uh, New York. And when she got to the White House, she couldn't believe there wasn't a library. So she petitioned Congress and had a dinner party and got the money and started sharing books and, and, and getting copies of books that the Library of Congress had to make a White House library. Julia Grant, as you mentioned, 
mentioned, I mean, she comes in at the end of the the Civil War. It's the it's it's the, it's just an era of celebration and and even you know opulence at, at that point. And and the Grant White House was was one of the more extravagant White Houses. And Julia loved to throw a good party, and it was always a good time in that White House. And uh, it, it is the, the stories of celebration versus the stories of tragedy versus just the everyday, the mundane. But it's interesting to know that these people go through it. Well, you know, what's interesting also is that um, your book, you know, um, unusual for their time on the road with America's first ladies. Uh, when you read it, you, you see that there's a similar thread throughout all of the first ladies, even till now. Uh, that you know, when we take a look at Eleanor Roosevelt and we take a look at other. Uh, powerful first ladies who've really made a difference, whether it be Jackie Onassis or even Hillary Clinton, Hillary Clinton taking on initiatives, and even Michelle with uh, Obama with her her initiatives. Uh, it's a traditional role for the first ladies to take on initiatives and try to make a, a difference, particularly with, within the realm of uh, the social aspect of our society. No, that's absolutely right, and and. Um you know, the, the the first first lady to kind of do this without having to do it. I mean, the, you can go back and you can look over history, but what what these women have done. And now, as you mentioned, it's expected. You know, now you have to do it. If, can you imagine if Michelle Obama or Laura Bush or anyone had had uh, had um, had gone into the White House and, and not done something, not had a cause, not done. And, and, and Laura Bush changed her cause, you know. She, she had literacy and other things that were going on domestically before 9-11, and then she shifted to be quite the international first lady and was, and was not very publicly well-traveled. I don't think that they promoted that a lot, but she, she was one of the most traveled first ladies in history, going all over the Middle East and working on women's rights and, 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 um, and uh, uh, things in a post-9-11 world that had to shift her, her sort of focal point. And, and that, you bring up another good point about, you know, Hillary Clinton and some others that have gone in on actual policy and taken a more political role. And that's something that I'm very surprised Michelle Obama didn't take. I, she's taken a more traditional uh, role in focusing on children and obesity and, 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 you know, making a garden and things that were, I mean, she is an extremely well-educated woman uh, and, and accomplished on her own right, and she could have come in and done a real policy move and picked up where Hillary left off and could have been much more involved in, in the health care and, and some of the other uh, things that, that uh, the, the Obama administration put through. But she took a, a more, uh, I hesitate even to say, a more female, you know, wifely role of, of, a, of a very on-her-own accomplished and, and powerful woman. But we look back all the way to play, to people like uh, Lucy Hayes and the Hayes administration. When, when uh, Rutherford B. Hayes was a governor, even before he was president, Lucy Hayes did things that were not traditionally done by women. She went out into the field. She did field work, recon. She went into insane asylums, mental hospitals, uh, did, hosted uh, events for, for Civil War veterans and did things with Civil War orphans. Very, very involved in this and brought that to the White House. So when she does things like this, just because it's the right thing to do and she wants to, it pays the road for people like Eleanor Roosevelt to come in and basically be the legs of her husband because of the, of the physical need, FDR being in a wheelchair. She could go out and do this because women like Lucy Hayes had come before her. Is there anything historic about Melania Trump, if she were to become First Lady? Uh, Melania Trump is speaking uh, as the keynote speaker on the first night of the RNC event, and um, she is obviously you know, foreign and foreign speaking. Uh, are there precedents here, or is she, is the, she the, unique? Absolutely. No, no, you, you, there is. There is this, this convention for the RNC is so important for Melania Trump. It's, it's more important for her than it is Donald. And here's why. We know Donald Trump. The world knows Donald Trump. The world doesn't know Melania Trump beyond magazine covers and being a model and being Donald Trump's wife. She would be, if Donald Trump were to win the presidency, the second only foreign-born first lady. The first foreign-born first lady is Louisa Catherine Adams. And she had never stepped foot in America until John Quincy Adams, her husband, brought her back to meet her presidential uh, in-laws. And, and uh, um, it, 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 it caused a little bit of problems for, for John Quincy Adams. His, his, his mother and father weren't exactly excited about the fact of him marrying a, a foreign-born woman because they thought it would hurt him politically. America is a new country. We're and trying to separate ourselves. I mean, where was she from? Where was she from? 
uh, Louisa Catherine Adams was born in England. England her yeah. father, her father was a was an importer uh, from uh, Maryland, from in the colonies, and was in London when the Civil War, uh, uh-huh. Civil War, when the uh, Revolutionary War broke out, and and uh, took his family. Uh, Louisa Catherine Adams was born in 1775 in in London, and so she he was still over there when um, when all the stuff was going down in the Revolutionary War, and he took his family to France, because France was our, our ally in, in that uh, conflict, as we were trying to get away from the British. And that's where they stayed, and then uh, John Quincy Adams met her, when uh, met Catherine, Louisa Catherine, when he was doing work for his father's uh, presidential administration. He was a foreign dignitary working in Europe, and that's when he met her. Well, so, yeah. anyway, you get back to, to Melania Trump, I mean, she now we we we're we're all much more worldly, and we look at this as her being sort of exotic, for for uh, lack of a better term. She's young, she's gorgeous. She would be on every single cover of every magazine. Should should she be first lady? Historically, Americans love young, pretty first ladies with children. You can go all the way back to. Uh, uh, Julia Tyler in the 10th administration, or uh, Frances Cleveland, the youngest first lady in history at the age of 21, wow. married to uh, Grover Cleveland, who was 49 at the time when they got married, only presidential couple to marry in the White House, only first lady to be married in the White House, and the country just went crazy, same as Jacqueline Kennedy, same as uh, uh, Michelle Obama with, with two young kids in, in the White House. Um, Americans are fascinated by this. The world is fascinated by this. I mean, these are our celebrities. These are our political celebrities, and the younger and the prettier they are, and the more magazine covers they're on, their popularity goes up. So if Melania comes on and really, really crushes the speech, um, she already does uh, philanthropic work. She works with, I, I believe, the, the Red Cross and does some things with, with breast cancer awareness. She could go uh, international, like, like I mentioned a post-9-11 uh, Laura Bush. She's from a war-torn country, uh, former Czech Republic, I believe, is, is where she's from. And um, so she could go in and, and work with orphans of, of, uh, of refugees or, or orphans of, of war-torn uh, countries and, and have an international flair to her. She speaks five different languages, and if she comes across well at this convention and her speech is polished and she takes that, that role, that form, on the national and international stage as a, as a viable first lady, as a force, uh, she, she can really, really do good things for her husband. Well, I want to follow up with Melania uh, after the break. I want to remind our listeners that we're speaking with Andy Oak, author of the book, Unusual for Their Time, On the Road with America's First Ladies. For more information about Andy Oak, please visit firstladiesman.com. You're listening to The Scott Adams Show, and we'll return after these messages. Well, that's right. My name is Scott Adams, and I'm joined by Leonor Kubota, and this is The Scott Adams Show. Well, we're going to continue our discussion with Andy Oak, author of the book, Unusual for Their Time, On the Road with America's First Ladies. For more information about Andy Oak, please visit firstladiesman.com. We're going to pick up where we left off before the break, and that was Melania Trump, because she's been front and center at the RNC. It's interesting. I was watching an interview with her with Greta Van Sestren, and she was asked, what about Donald Trump bothers him the most? And she said, stupidity. And I was a little bit taken back by that response, because normally you see American first ladies give these kind of like pat answers. And that's mm-hmm. that's not a pat answer. And I don't think she's a pat person, pat in person. You know, she she beats to her own drum, says what's on her mind, speaks how she feels. Much like Trump, I can see how they get along so well. Sure, and and in that role and in that personality trait, she would be like Betty Ford, one of the most influential first ladies of all times. Betty Ford took a stance against what her husband's party, the Republican Party at the time, for women's rights, and she went out and she spoke her mind about her addictions, her her substance abuse, about breast cancer. Again, I, uh, it was not on the national stage. It wasn't on everyone's radar. It was sort of hush-hush, almost like an embarrassment kind of thing. And women didn't talk about those kind of things. And there wasn't that open-air discussions and, and, and support groups and, and all the other things that come along with those with those things when, when you start to talk about them. And Betty Ford came out and put all of that on people's radar. And if Melania Trump is a plain-speaking, no-nonsense, international, young, pretty, I mean, she, re- she really stands to do amazing things as an influential first lady. I mean, and she's, and, and, she's not just another pretty face. She's, there's, there's brains behind the, uh, behind the beauty. And then that result of that is votes, our votes, right? <laughs> well, there you go. And, and historically, again... 
all first ladies are more popular than their husbands. Right. It's just it's just it's just the way it is. When 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 a president's uh, uh, um, polls are down in the down in the down in the tank, then then you know a first lady can come out and do wonderful things for him. And and and, and even you know I mean, look, let's face it, Trump's a polarizing guy. He comes on the scene and people fall in love with his wife. It just softens him up, and people tend to be more forgiving of this. But it, and that goes all the way back to Dolly Madison. People yeah. didn't like um, Madison. Uh, he, he, well, I shouldn't say people didn't like it. He was all business. He was a short little guy. We had a lot of tall presidents in George Washington, James Monroe, Thomas Jefferson, all these big, tall, good-looking guys. And Madison's sort of like this little dumpy guy, but he comes <laughs> along with this hot wife. I mean, Dolly Madison was, was a very attractive woman. And she wore risque, you know, plunging necklines for the time and got a lot of physical attention, and she threw a good party. People loved hanging out with Dolly Madison. And James Madison's uh, likability and polls went up because Dolly greased those skids. It's, it's a true partnership. It really, really is. And when you take it as such, and presidential couples, uh, presidents and first ladies that work well together and complement each other, you could also say uh, Grace and Calvin Coolidge. You know, Silent Cal, that dude never strung more than five words together unless he had a prepared speech and he had to. There was some uh, woman sat next to him at a dinner party once. And said, I'll <laughs> bet you, I don't know what the bet was, you know, it could have been five, ten dollars, that I can get you to say um, more than three words in the next minute. And he just looked at her and said, you lose. And that was the last thing he said to her. He was not a very personable guy. He wasn't a big, huggy, warm, fuzzy. He wasn't a Theodore Roosevelt. Um, uh, and then Grace Coolidge could not have been more affable, could not have been more pleasant, giggly, uh, 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 liked a good party, great dresser, good-looking lady. Um, she, she taught uh, uh, deaf and, and, and blind students, uh, uh, more, more deaf, as she worked at the Clark School for the Deaf in, um, in Northampton, Vermont, or uh, Northampton, Massachusetts, rather, where the two met and started dating, but these, these women that compliment their husbands and pick up at their husbands' shortcomings really, really improve the polls and the likabilities, and then thus the, 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 the uh, success of, of their husbands. Well, what they say is behind every man is a woman who made it necessary. So uh, Melania well, Trump seems to fit the bill. That's very true. And, and every one of my speeches, you can go to firstladiesman.com and look at the tour schedule there, and every place I start off at the beginning, I say, Behind every great man is an even greater woman, and it's never been more true than in this country, and it started with number one. It started with Martha Washington, the country. We would not be having this discussion, and we would not be in America if George Washington had not met Martha Dandridge. It's explained in the book, and I don't think I'm being overdramatic when I say if George Washington had met and fallen in love with another woman, things would have been very, very different. Martha Washington changed the course of America and thus the history of the world forever. Well, you know, and I also like the tone that we have going on in this election season where uh, Melania Trump speaks about America so positively, so favorably. She just absolutely loves America. She's a foreigner who has chosen to assimilate with America and American values. And, I, you know, I, I'm just so happy to see that. Uh, because, you know, when Barack Obama was running for office, uh, I think Michelle gave a speech and said, for the first time in her adult life, she was proud of her country. And I thought, wow, that's, that's, not, that's not great energy I'm feeling here. No, it's not, you know, and, and, and there's a lot of, I know that Hillary is bringing up in her, her stump speeches saying, you know, Donald Trump badmouths America and says he's going to make it great again. Well, I think it's great now. And, and, and there's another, you know, there are, there are things that are going on right now that people aren't happy with. So I think that's what Trump is zeroing in on. And then Hillary, you know, as, as any opponent would, uh, zeroes in on that and turns what Trump's trying to make a positive into a negative. But again, you've got this, this support. You've got this uh, significant other that's coming out and saying, hey, I'm the American dream. I'm why America works. I come from a war-torn country that would have been, you know, standing in bread lines for the rest of my life. But I found a way out, and I found a, a very, a very, very, uh, uh, um, 
you know, over the top layout and just in, in modeling and becoming a supermodel and then marrying one of the richest guys in the world. I mean, if that's not, you know, rags to riches, I don't, I don't know yeah. what is. Absolutely. And that strikes a chord with people. Absolutely. And you know, she does remind me of another famous woman, Carla Bruni, who became the first lady of France, who was a singer and a model as well. And she was also highly intelligent, just like Melania Trump. So no, I think Melania Trump is a wonderful ambassador for the United States because she has said over and over again that we need tough borders and we need, we need to make our country strong and brave again. So Leonore, you uh, actually recently completed the entire book. Yes. Unusual for their time on the road with America's first ladies. And that is a book written by our guest, Andy Oak. Uh, you can find out more information about that book by visiting firstladiesman.com. But tell us what you really think about the book. Leonore. Well, I like the, in fact, that it brought you into the lives of these women. I also like the part that you talked about your visits to all the different museums and homes and everything else and how somehow they had to shift their focus because they were used to talking about the presidents. And because you came in and spoke to them and focused on the first ladies, they suddenly had to shift their presentation and how they communicated. So it created a new purview in which their particular venue was viewed. And so I thought that was very insightful. So I cannot, um, as I said earlier, recommend the book highly enough and i know there's a volume two in the works and i'm oh, really yeah. excited to read that because that picks up after ida mckinley well andy when is volume two coming out i'm writing it as we speak um i have started work on it we are in hopes of bringing it out early in uh 2017 um i want to write all the way up to um november and then wait and see what's going to happen and then i will write uh, maybe I'll, I'll write all the way up to michelle obama then leave a blank chapter, then write the conclusion to the book, and then I will go back and write the final chapter before the conclusion as to whoever our new first lady or first gentleman is and, and, uh, and see what kind of gaps I need to fill in there and then hopefully release it sometime uh, around the inauguration, I think would be, would be perfect timing. So that's, that's what my goal is. That's what I'm, what, what I'm striving for. And, um, and you know, we, we will see what happens in November, and we'll see how the book ends. It's, I, I, I can't, I can't finish, finish Volume 2 in, until after the election. Well, if, if, it's, a first, make sense in my if head. it's a first gentleman, you're going to have to change the, the name of your book, aren't you? Well, everyone says I get that a lot too. I mean, it, it, it's funny. I, I I will always be the first ladies' man, and it will always be unusual for their time on the road with America's first ladies, volume one and and volume two. Uh, we'll have to see what happens with volume three, or when I put volume one and volume two together in an expanded. Because that's the other thing. It's like I'm continuing my research. I'm continuing my travels. I was just recently speaking down in Greensboro, North Carolina, which is near Guilford County, where Dolly Madison was born. The uh, travels I did for the series, I should also mention, all of this is possible and everything. I mean, none of it was my idea to begin with. I was a, uh, one of the producers for C-SPAN's First Ladies Influence and Image, part of a great production team, and I just happened to be the guy that did all the traveling. I was the only producer that traveled for the series, and I went by myself to every location, Martha Washington through Michelle Obama, to tell the stories of these women to get into the, to the 90-minute show that was uh, featured each of the First Ladies. And now, what there wasn't time for, or what there wasn't budget for, to go to uh, to each location for each first lady, I'm now circling back and doing my own independent research to add on to what I learned and gained in the C-SPAN series. So uh, there's more stories to tell. There's more artifacts to see. There's there's more places to go. So volume one will end up to be expanded along with as I continue to write. Uh, I I, I uh, interviewed and and spoke with a former White House butler that was in the uh, White House uh, from Carter, uh, the, la the final days of Carter up through the middle of George H.W. Bush. Well, that, had, there was, there was, that just didn't happen when the series came out, so now that's additional research. So the books will continue to write, and, and I will continue to, to write them as the stories continue, but, but um, adding on, adding on uh, potentially Bill Clinton as a, as a first gentleman, um, we'll, we'll keep, we'll keep my, my first lady's <laughs> man name the same, we'll keep the website the same, and we'll keep the book title the same. It'll just be, you know, an unusual chapter about an unusual guy that's in an unusual position and blazing new trails as the first first gentleman well he'll be the second ladies man in a sense right 
with the Energizer <laughs> Bunny or whatever. <laughs> but, I, but, you know, this, this will be in Volume 2. Here's a little teaser for Volume 2 that some people may know a, a little bit about, but not to the extent that, that I found in my, in my research for the series, is that if Hillary Clinton does win, she will be the first official female president, but the first unofficial female president was Edith Wilson, President Woodrow Wilson's second wife. And um, I've, I've read letters that, that prove it to me beyond beyond a, 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 the slightest doubt that, that she, she was running the White House while Wilson was recovering from his stroke. There's, wow. there's no doubt in my mind. Interesting. All right. Well, we want to remind our listeners that we're speaking with Andy Oak, author of the book, Unusual for Their Time, On the Road with America's First Ladies. For more information about Andy Oak, please visit firstladiesman.com. Well, Andy, we want to thank you for hanging out with the Scott Adams Show today. Thank you so much. Have me back anytime. I love talking with you guys. Likewise. We'll see you next time on the radio. Bye-bye now. You bet.